You sure? Hey, hey, John. How are you doing? Hi. Okay, good. That's good, 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 good. Hi there. Uh, hi, John. Can you yes. hear me well? Yep, yep. Okay, all, all right. good, all good. Okay. So we would, uh, we would start with the introduction very shortly. Then we would roll in with the forum. All right. All right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are feeling okay. Dah lepas makan, maybe you guys are ngantuk or anything. So maybe can I get a little bit of energy check inside the chat box? Uh, rate yourself one to five. Five means you're super energetic. One meaning, oh, I think I need a lot of energy. So let's see in the chat box. Come, come. Or if you have any, uh, if you want to show reaction, you can also show your reaction in the chat. Uh, in the, like for example, show a heart shake or thumbs up. Well, I see four. I see ten thousand. Or I see one. Oh my God, Mr. Allen, let's get you some energy. Oh, we see some threes, some fives. Okay, nice. So amazing. Okay, so for everyone who is uh like not feeling like a super five or it's just a mega three, let's do a little bit of stretching. So I hope you guys can just raise your hands up in the air and then just go to your right hand side, stretch your back, go to your left hand side, stretch over there. So yeah. And today, let's give energy, the amount of energy that we also wish to receive. So let's try our best to manage our energy, get some snacks, some coffee, and let's enjoy the session. So, so today, we have a very interesting event for you guys. It's a bit different from our typical Care for You webinar for the past two days. So instead of sessions, we're actually having forums so it's going to be a lot of discussion, a lot of insights from experts. So today, the first session that we're starting is managing your finance. This is because financial well-being also plays a big important role in our lives, in well-being and at personal life as well. So we have invited special guests, Mr. John from PM Care, Dr. Nabila from Teach for Malaysia and Derek Fu from East Spring Investments. So they'll be sharing you some tips and tricks on how to manage your finance. And then later on, we will have another forum, but this time it's more on social well-being, mean culture of giving back. I'm sure every one of you have been through the floods, been through the hardships of pandemic, and not only do you receive some help and support from other people, perhaps some of you may also want to seek out ways to give support and give back to community, maybe to your office, maybe to your neighborhood, so this session will give you a bit of insight to work on social well-being. We have with us in that session, Mallory from Work Inspires and founder and CEO of Buy One Give One from Singapore company, Masami Sato. And another social entrepreneur, Picha Eats, Miss Kim. So stay tuned for those sessions later on. So without further ado, let's move on to the next slide. So in our financial well-being forum, you're going to see John, you moderate, and we have two special panelists with us, Dr. Nabila and Derek Fu. So I'll pass it to Mr. John. Thank you. Thank you, Kai, for the pleasant introduction. So um, thank you, everyone, to uh, attend this uh, event today. So for those who have joined us for the past two days, welcome back. Those who have just joined us, uh, welcome to the event and we hope that you get a good insight on today's topic. 
And uh, let us kick start with the introduction of the speakers. So first of all, I would introduce uh, Dr. Nabila. So Dr. Nabila has a PhD in accounting. She is a member of a Malaysian Accounting Association with nine years experience in academia research ranging from forensic accounting to financial literacy. She is a strong advocate for the underserved community to work towards financial freedom. So today she will be uh, bridging the gap uh, financial gaps from the B40 community, while Mr. Derek is the regional manager for channel marketing and distribution from eSpring Investment. He has nine years experience in the banking and financial industry, and he's a licensed consultant with Federation of Investment Managers Malaysia since 2013. So he will share a little bit of a bigger, bigger perspective and some uh, financial uh, habits that, um, you know, from his point of view that, you know, probably some of the listeners would Will pick up. So um, let me give some context of today's uh, discussion. So we know like the COVID pandemic has given a unprecedented, you know, financial stress, work stress, and let alone health stress to uh, a lot of Malaysians. And from a publication from EPF uh, in December last year, uh, the I Lestari, I Sina, I Chitra. Um, the total um, withdrawals from EPF uh, amounts to a total of, I think, 100 billion, 100 billion. And um, from the uh, from the withdrawals, it shows that 6.1 million members, uh, 6.1 million members now have less than 10,000 in their EPF accounts, which of which 3.6 million has less than, less than 1,000. 3.6 million of contributing members in the EPF have less than 1,000. So, you know, looking at this and now economies is starting to recover, we see jobs, uh, you know, more vacancies are, you know, are being posted by a lot of businesses. But, you know, looking from the B40 community, Dr. Navila, question for you. How do you see, you know, the pandemic has impacted the B40 community and what sort of road to recovery that you see that, you know, these people um, I mean, this community can do in the recovery stage to, you know, recuperate what has been done, what has been lost. Thank you, John, for the question. So um, basically from what I have um, observed so far, we have a lot of government support throughout the times of pandemic. You have from, KID, uh, from EPF, we have the uh, BPN, we have multiple, multiple government and non-governmental uh, organization trying to help especially those that focus to um, B40 and some of the M40 as well. But, uh, but we need to ponder also, um, if previously we are already at several stages of economic well-being or economic household income as a whole. So in terms for them to recuperate, in terms of um, trying to recover, trying to survive beyond the pandemic, it's more to a sense that they need to understand where their financial position is at, where is their saving, what would be their expenditure, because living, especially living in a city, even those who are still single, um, it was discovered recently, uh, 2020, that the minimum uh, expenditure for single people is around 1,000 ringgit. And even more for those who are in a family, 3,000 ringgit for them to manage a family. So with the minimum wage is not increasing or not being stagnant throughout the, this whole pandemic and nothing is being changed about it. Um, so for, it would be more to um, pondering upon how they can actually save from what they have they have spent throughout the months because um, most people in the B40 community and I believe some in the corporate sector, some of them who are not T20, um, is more a dependent on their income, their salary every month. So it's more to uh, good for us all to be able to understand our own budget. What do we spend? How how are we? What would we want to um, achieve by the end of the particular month? So in terms of recuperating, in terms of recovering, being able to be in charge of your own expenditure and your own spending is the most crucial, I believe, in this. Um, pandemic that we have right now. I understand. 
I think um, going to there just now, Dr. Nabila did mention about expenditure and also stagnating, uh, stagnating uh, I think wages uh, throughout the past two years because a lot of bosses, employers will say, oh, it's a pandemic, we, we can't afford a pay raise. But um, in the recent studies, it's shown that inflation starts to kick in. Um, and there's a delayed, you know, a delayed onset of inflation because now logistics are increasing their prices, you know, cost of goods are increasing and ringgit is depreciating. Um, with the with the current stagnating wages and increasing expenditure, you know, Derek, in your point of view, how can maybe the B40 community or even the M40 community um, able to really control the expenditure and have uh, a, a really good amount of savings for their, you know, monthly expenses and how would you help them navigate that? Yeah, hi John, uh, hi Dr. Nabila, nice to meet you as well. Um, I think first things first is that, you know, uh, what Dr. Nabila point, rightly pointed out just now is that, you know, a lot of us when we have, uh, we are reliant on our income and, you know, when all things are good, you know, under usual circumstances, you know, we can get by in our lives. You know, but, you know, I think after something major like, you know, over the past two years when an event like COVID or even the recent floods in Malaysia hits us, then that is when we start to realize that, hey, you know, there's something more that needs to be done in order to be able to say that I'm financially well off. All right. So definitely, I think one of the most important mindsets to have is to always save before you spend. I know a lot of people try to, you know, focus on curbing spending, you know, uh, try to not buy so many new clothes, you know, that sneaker that you are looking out that's releasing tomorrow, you know, try to hold it off, you know. Yeah, that, that is one way to actually manage your spending. But I think, you know, crucially as well, it is important to save before you spend. All right, because if you were to spend and to save what is left over, I think most of the time, you know, most of us would agree that there would be nothing left to save. All right, so always save before you spend. But, you know, by going one step further, you know, uh, if, if you were to be, let's say, for example, under the B40 group and you might think that, okay, let's say, for example, I were to, I were to save 20% of my income, all right, how is that going to make me rich, you know, if let's say my income is not high? Of course, if you were to have a high income, then yes, definitely that would get you rich over time. But, you know, if you have a slightly lower income, how can this habit actually help you build your financial well-being? All right, so that is why we always, you know, at Eastspring Investments, we encourage people to save, but at the same time, take the step further and make your savings work. All right, you can save into, you know, many in investment instruments out there that's available at a very affordable cost. All right. And, you know, that is certainly one way that, you know, anybody, whether you are young or more senior in the industry, anybody can actually start anytime. Mm -hmm. I think Derek pointed out very truly on uh, anyone can save and also anyone can invest in any amount. I think um, we will get back to that in the later session of the forum, but I want to come back to the wages and work opportunities. So for, um, for a lot of businesses right now, they are open for business and there's a lot of vacancy around in the market. Um, you know, what is the gap between, let's say, um, unemployment and, you know, employers not able to find their you know the right staff and is there is this something that we are not looking at dr navila in your opinion do you think that is is it harder for you know the b40 community to get a job or is this something that is missing in between since there's you know from what i observe there's there's quite a bit of a vacancy out there and you know businesses are una unable to get the employees um thanks john for the question so um when we talk on the job side, on the HR side, I think the the, the reason for this gap that we're observing is more to um, the matching between the skills and also the individual. Because sometimes what we what we what we might write in the resume might not what we reflect as as a as a human being. So when um well when it comes to HR perspective, perhaps the recruiter might not be seeing the individual, their applicants as uh, what they would require. So this uh, this mismatch somehow um, led to a lot of employment during the pandemic. Also, to add to that, there was this term that we call the great resignation, 
whereby everybody is raising, uh, during the pandemic, they realize that their mental well-being is being at stake. Um, so uh, they start to think twice about whether to continue with the job or whether they should start a new business or whether whatever the um, opportunity that might come. But um, throughout the pandemic, uh, in terms of uh, having this B40 to be on board with their job perspective, then it comes to the competition all over again. Because we know um, students are coming out of universities as fresh graduates, but the job market is not being suitable to them. There's not much opportunity for fresh graduates. Perhaps they need to divert themselves and perhaps to gain the experience that might not be available for them during pandemic because, because of the physical virtual thing that might prohibit them from getting experiences in multiple uh, situations. Perhaps uh, that could have been uh, uh, some some kind of stumbling block for them. So especially for um, this new batch, new batch of these pandemic graduates, um, it seems like um, for them to really understand that they are going out into a working uh, environment that is so foreign for them, uh, then it comes to a sense that they might feel they're not comfortable with the job when they eventually get the job. So with this kind of contradiction that is uh, going to the minds of um, a lot of these graduates, so this is where they uh, eventually got stuck being unemployed. They don't know what to do. And it would be a high time for them to start exploring what they like because uh, during this time of pandemic, we are most of us are at home, working at home, doing things at home. So, um, in terms of creating job opportunity for them, for, for oneself, um, they can start with what they like. So, because all in all, if you want to be comfortable in your working environment, you need to be, you need to like at least like what you are doing. Not not to the most part of loving what you do, but at least for you to be comfortable, you are okay with the job scope that you're doing. So same goes with creating, um, being an entrepreneur, creating a business. Uh, so if you're not, you you have your clashing opinions with what you are selling, so then it goes back to um, not selling the items, then it comes back to not having an income. So um, all these things, it, it needs to be reflected by a lot of people within the community. Um, whether what you are doing right now is best for you. If, is it giving you a lot of income, but you don't like it? Is it not giving you as much, but you really enjoy doing it? And that's how the sustainability of income comes in. Because whenever you start not liking or rejecting something, that is where everything would be a little bit backward for you. Mm -hmm. That's true enough. Um, how about Derek? What's your opinion about that? I think just now Dr. Navila mentioned about sustainable, you know, income, right? And and in pandemic situations, a, a lot of income seems to be a little bit unsustainable. What's your opinion on the current unemployment status and probably, you know, people uh, working on uh, the gig economy or a side job, you know, like online business? What's your take on that? Well, I think I, like what Dr. Nabila actually shared just now, you know, we all want that perfect job, right? That perfect balance of having good income, having the having a good job that you enjoy a lot and having the best environment, you know, that we that we can actually uh, work in, you know. But I think, you know, over the last two years, certainly, especially, you know, um, uh, given the circumstances that we have all been facing, you know, I think, uh, like what Dr. Nabila again rightly pointed out, you know, it is more than just the income, you know, it is the amount of stress that we all face by working from home. Uh, it is not something that we are accustomed to. And, you know, it is something that we all had to make a big reaction to and learn and adapt really, really quickly before, you know, uh, going through the entire uh, last two years. And in fact, some of us, right now are still going through it and you know we are just slowly easing back into our normal way of working so so yeah you know i think um in any any employment you know there are challenges but uh, over the last two years uh, i think even more so that you know it is not just about the job that you have in hand but adapting to the circumstances which we do not have control over so i think we can all give ourselves a big pat on the back 
you know, to to say that uh, it's it's a uh, very uh, it's well done, you know, for going through the last two years, and I'm sure this will make us all stronger for what the future holds, definitely. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Larry, and um, a, a shout out for those who have survived the pandemic for two years. Kudos to you. Uh, for those who are just joining us, um, we are talking about uh, how to manage your you know, finances, um, and we have Dr. Nobila and Derek here as the panelists. So coming back to just now on health, you know, we are we are talking about health being today, and because of financial stress, you know, the pandemic, you know, worry about health and mental health. Um, there is, you know, a, a, a fine line between, um, I think, financial security and also uh, overall well-being. Um, you know, since I started with Nabila, Dr. Nabila a lot, then I'll go with um, Derek here first. So, um, in your opinion, um, where is the line should be drawn, you know, in terms of well-being, you know, um, working for income and savings and investments? Where do you where do you put the balance there? You know, what's your advice to the listeners here? Well, um, I, I think generally speaking, the two of them are quite, you know, correlated in some ways. You know, the more money you have, the happier you'll be, right? Who doesn't love money? You know, but but I think on a serious note, you know, it is uh, of course important to be able to sustain a high income or an income good enough to support your family for a lot of us. But I think at the same time, we should not neglect or try not to neglect too much on our personal well-being because. I do have friends uh, who are, you know, I, my, my, I'm personally from Johor Bahru, so I do have friends who are, you know, used to travel in and out of Singapore uh, just to get that higher income, but, uh, you know, at the expense of their health because, you know, of the early hours, the long jam hours, you know, that took a toll on their health over time, you know. So, of course, it is easier said than done, but it is important you know, to actually take note of your own personal health and well-being while at the same time trying to secure that, that you know, income for your family, all right? Which is why, you know, uh, hopefully through this forum today, later on, if I can actually, you know, provide a little bit of insights or mindsets into how you can, you know, manage your finances outside of your income, hopefully that would actually contribute to you having a better overall well-being, you know, without having too much stress over your income. So a, a short teaser for, for the listeners here later, we'll get Derek to share some tools for you to sort of assess your current health, financial health, and maybe, you know, some some of the tips there, uh, not, not the investment tips, but some guidance on what sort of investment directions that you can provide. So coming back to Dr. Navila, just now we talked about um, health and health and well-being with uh, financial security. Uh, what are the signs that, you know, people can look out for amongst their peers or within themselves that they are actually overworked, you know, beyond their means and they should take a step back? Okay, hey, that's a very good question, John. Um, um, a lot because during the pandemic, we're we're not we don't see each other that well, so it's it's quite tricky for a friend to actually identify if a, a person is actually having financial stress or or any kind of stress in that matter. But um, one of the ways that as as a support system that amongst your family, amongst your friends, what we can do is just to uh, look out for each other and um, always see the expenditures that your friends are doing. Because um, sometimes, perhaps among colleagues, you might be able to not to, to have the exact um, expenditure or the income that your friends are having, but uh, more to like having a, a generalized assumption of what your friends might have and where are they spending it like say for example if suddenly during the pandemic your friend changes your car or perhaps suddenly they buy a house maybe perhaps buying a house is a is an advantage because of the hoc uh promotion that we had last year but then again uh in terms of looking at looking after another individual um more to see how they actually would react in things in terms of money because sometimes um, they will uh, I I it's in a lot of cases in a lot especially with millennials nowadays they they know that they they can invest they are they are, today's millennials are quite I would say um, in terms of their financial literacy to make investment they have that 
but for them to actually be able to understand and manage their own investment is another thing. So this is where a lot of scam that uh, that emerges. I think I think recently, like the past one or two months, a lot of scammers are calling and everyone is not trusting each other anymore because got getting calls from the police, getting calls from LHDN. So um, this gives some sort of like a barrier for friends to look up for each other. But then again, um, it's good if you, uh, if as an individual, you know what you're spending, like Derek said, and uh, making sure that your personal uh, your personal expenditure is also covered while at the same time looking after your family's expenditure and uh, at the same time know where you are going to channel your savings especially when it comes to your investment because when we talk about investment it's a lot it's a very broad perspective you can invest anywhere but there's always a risk to it it's whether you you can understand the risk or are you just going to succumb to whatever um, may come in the future. So I think Derek will be uh, more uh, uh, giving more input on this. But uh, yeah, like like I was saying, it's more to that um, when it comes to looking after each other in terms of financial, it's more to um, making sure that whatever um, savings, not to say saving, like your saving is very personal. Whatever you decide to do with, with your saving is your own um, your own decision to make but more more or less to see if the expenditure is not so much or pressuring to your friends or to your uh, family members to your to your kids because sometimes uh yeah especially with the kids nowadays teenagers nowadays they are very uh, they are very groomed with the k-pop culture so sometimes they would start spending on photo cards they start spending on souvenirs with their respective artists so these are the unnecessary expenditure that they might be uh, doing, but then perhaps they reach out to their sibling to pay for it. So, so then it channels the expenditure from one person to another, and that might um, create stress between the two persons. So yeah, so I, uh, I believe that um, looking after one another in terms of financial would be more to getting to know where the level of um, financial health that the friend is going through. So I'm very interested to listen to Derek's instrument to check the financial health check as well, <laughs> because because before this I've been using um, what what I personally use is more to this uh, secrets uh, indicator. So it, it, it secrets is also a good indicator for you to keep yourself in check. So mm. there's there's of course there's a, the free version and there's the subscription version. But all in all, for you to like, on a general aspect, on a very surface level, it's good for you to know where you are standing financially. Also, it, it also helps you to see whether your name is being used for something else or um, like you suddenly you have a credit card you don't even apply for. So this uh, these instruments are very good to actually keep you in check, keep yourself in check whether whatever that you have spent is actually reflecting to yourself. Mm -hmm. I think I pick up to, I think two main things from Dr. Navilla. One is, of course, I think it's the discipline on spending and also, you know, how to control um, expenditure. I think another one that you mentioned is a lot of people, uh, especially youngsters nowadays, go into investment and they got uh, scams, you know, maybe or they, they landed into the wrong side of investment. So, you know, um, I mean, coming back to Derek, uh, since, you know, East Spring Investment also advocates on investment. So um, for the youngsters out there or let alone for um, very um, nascent investors out there probably who have saved some cash, that means they have managed to have some savings and now they want to grow the, 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 the money that they save, you know. What sort of thing that they should look out for, you know, as a as a very retail type of investors, should they, you know, put their money into financial institutions like maybe trusts or whatnot, or you know, what's your take on that? Yeah, uh, thanks, John. I mean, um, in the the thing is, in the world we live in today, you know, uh, with the internet, I think information is so 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 accessible to everybody now. That you know, let's say for example, um, if you want to know more about investments and currently you have never engaged investments before, just give it a quick Google, and I think there will be tons and tons of 
articles, information that is ready for you to go and digest and read to allow you to gain some knowledge on the topic, you know. So that is actually a very, very powerful thing, which is why, as Dr. Nobila rightly pointed out, you know, generally speaking, the youngsters nowadays, they are more uh, investment savvy in a sense that, you know, they understand what investments is all about. And, you know, they, they have, uh, you know, actually engaged this concept from a very, very young age. But however, while this is a very powerful tool, you know, it can be dangerous, you know, as, as what was said, you know, there are a lot of scams, especially over the last two years. There are a lot of financial gurus online who are giving tips and, you know, financial advisors. So the most important thing I would say is, you know, first of all, actually, uh, it is, I would, I want to say that it is good that people, you know, especially from a young age are starting to look at investments because it is important. And, you know, at East Spring, we always say that investments is for the long term. All right. There is no uh, greedy and or it's not gambling. You know, it is not a one time gain, but it is something that we want to do. And over time, it gives us a long term uh, steady return. All right. So that is why I, I would say that for those of you who are young and you have already started looking to investments, uh, I want to congratulate you because it is actually a great advantage that you are looking at investments at a young age. But at the same time, of course, like I said, you know, it, it can be dangerous because like any investments, uh, there are some risks associated to it, however high or however low. So the most important thing is it is, of course, good to read up. It is good to, you know, you, you may listen to a lot of the advices or articles that are posted online, but the most important thing is you need to understand where you are putting your money into. All right. I think a lot of us, we fall victim into simply listening or jumping on the boat, you know, jumping on the bandwagon as to what is the current trend, you know, uh, so and so have made this however much from these particular investments and whatnot without finding out what it actually is, you know, so that can be very dangerous because the moment you are not aware of where, where you are putting your money into, then it could lead to, you know, future disappointments. All right. So that's the first important mindset to have, which is to always be aware of, you know, where you are putting your money into. The second thing that, you know, uh, I would strongly advocate, you know, is actually regular investments, which, you know, over at East Spring Investments, uh, you know, we are very, very supportive and strong advocates of regular investments or what we call REACH over here at East Spring, which stands for Regular Investment Choice. The thing about investing regularly is that, you know, back to what John asked just now, you know, to those of you who have maybe saved up some cash or some money over the pandemic, you know, and you are thinking of investing, you know, that that is a great way to start, you know, but at the same time, I think when it comes to investments, it's always important to adopt a long term view whereby investing consistently is, uh, you know, uh, more recommended over a one time investment. You know, because when it comes to investment, we are not, we, we don't want to tell you that, okay, you have some cash right now, do a one-time investment and you're going to get rich. You know, of course, there may be have been instances in the past or among your friends that they have done so and they have, you know, uh, somehow, you know, managed to get into the right time and things worked out for them. And it may seem easy, you know, and quick to gain a quick return from investments, but, you know, over, over time, you know, generally speaking, investments works better over the long term, which is why we recommend doing regular investments whereby don't invest at one go, but slowly accumulate and build your investment portfolio over time. You know, so the thing about it is to be consistent and be patient. All right, because if you are consistent, then over time you can accumulate the, the wealth that you are looking for and be patient because when it comes to investments, it is very, very, very difficult to time the market. We all want to. We all want to invest when the market is the lowest and sell it off at the highest. You know, but the thing is, how many of us can actually do so? I mean, we are humans and human nature tells us that when the market is coming down, we are fearful. You know, we, we dare not enter the market. And when market is going up, we are always greedy because we always want more. All right. So that is why it is so difficult to time the market. But actually, the easier thing to do is to just give the market time. 
You know, so don't time the market, but give the market time because generally speaking and historically speaking, you know, over time, if you were to invest consistently and if you were to give the market enough time, generally speaking, your your portfolio would grow over the years. All right. So I think that is the, the one main uh, method that I would actually recommend to a lot of you who are looking to start your investments. And, you know, this is a very stress free and easy and affordable way that you can begin your investment journey. Yeah, I mean, if I were to summarize what Derek mentioned is I think first thing is to know where you put your money at. And secondly, is to be patient and consistent, uh, you know, as, as in savings is like put in a long term goal and don't expect fast buck fast money in, you know, through investment that is basically is gambling already rather than is investment. So um, I think we have been talking a lot revolving at personal level. So here, let us switch the perspective a little bit. Um, let us talk about from the, let's say, employer side of things, maybe from HR side of things, how can company, you know, be a little bit more supportive, you know, for, for maybe staffs or employees who have um, certain challenges in terms of financials or maybe in, in, in situations that they, they might feel, you know, a little bit challenged to complete what they're supposed to do. Um, let us, Dr. Navila, so let's say from your experience, right, um, from what you have seen, let's say from the B4D community on the financial literacy education, you know, and you know, what do you think, you know, from the HR or the employer side of things uh, can provide to the employees to really, um, you know, um, make them uh, a little bit more empowered in terms of their financial uh, situation? All right, I, I think speaking from an employer's perspective, right, because we, you know you know how employers are restricted of giving the income based on the eight hours that they're working every day, right? So uh, I believe uh, in this in this sense, um, for employers would be more to giving a peace of mind to the employees. Let's say for example, uh, because it, it was how it's supposed to be after eight hours of work right the employees should be um should not be restricted to do anything else they should not if if the employees are not giving them overtime they should be released from their workload after office hours so i think to the most the bare minimum that employers could give uh, because i'm sure in terms of other things in uh, for when we come when when it comes to um financial well-being of employees uh Employees are very restricted to the budget that they have. So um, one of the things uh, is more to giving the employees space because I, I know some of uh, a lot of companies, they they are quite flexible on whether the employee should be allowed to have side, side jobs or side businesses. But some uh, I think there's also quite a few who doesn't agree to that. Like you, you are only subjected to this position only. So um, one of the things to, to give a peace of mind to the employees for them to be able to be empowered that other than my nine to five job, I can also be doing something else uh, that gives me uh, additional income. It can be active income, it can be passive income because uh, if, uh, let's say for example, um, someone is very interested in looking into stock market, they need, they need time to actually understand how the market fluctuates. So they need, the space also for them to actually uh, look into resources. So this would be the avenue that can be provided by HR or by the employees to the uh, uh, to their employees. Because at the end of the day, it's more to uh, making sure that your employees are able to do uh, tasks that complies to your organizational objective without having setbacks. So if the company has too many restraints, if, if they restrict their employees in so many things, uh, let's say, for example, you can't, you can't have this, and uh, you can, you cannot invest in certain, certain things. You can't have your side business uh, outside of office hours. You need to be on call 24 seven. So this is not healthy, not only on financial side, because they don't have uh, any way for them to generate more income, but also to mentally, to their uh, mental well-being as well, because they're too stressed on only focusing on one thing. Because uh, looking into a person, a personal perspective, a lot 
are capable to multitask. Well, some people might not, but some people do. Um, yeah, so having them to explore um, options uh, in terms of trying to um, making or generating more income for themselves is a good way that employers could leverage on because at the end of the day, if the employees are not happy, so they might they might just shut off and not be able to even perform within their tasks in the company. So that would be my take on this. Be before I move on to Derek, just a quick uh, follow up question to Dr. Yeah. Nandia on that. Um, won't you, won't you, won't they say the HR worry that the focus at work is not there? You know, if they perform like multiple roles, of course, it's stretching out their, their, you know, their, uh, their work. Uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, focus, you know, in two things at once. Uh, and, you know, a following up on that is, do you think that because of the pandemic, the implementation of, let's say, work from home, deprive of certain, um, let's say, uh, benefit to the employees, such as OT claims, etc.? Uh, I I believe not because because whatever you do, even if you're working from home, this this comes to how the organization uh, organizational structure is. If let's say the uh your the employees are open enough to um to trust their employees to be be doing their job, so even if let's say perhaps OT is something that they dictate to you need to be physically in office. Right to do your task, but uh, but then again, it comes to a sense that in a lot of sectors, working from home has become something that is twenty four seven to them. OT or no OT, you still have to respond to your bosses. You still need to respond to your customers. So, um, having said that, uh, in terms of benefit by employers, I believe that um, it should be compensatable to the employees. If they are able to deliver what they are expected, so even with uh, with some OTs that they uh, that they have claimed that they are doing, as long as it it is justifiable, then it should be fine. But uh, then again, talking from HR perspective, there might be some restrictions uh, in terms of uh, the um, the working hours and all the uh, criteria that needs to be fulfilled in order for something to become. Uh, an OT claim, but yeah, my take is that in the situation of pandemic, we have been exhausted in many resources, our time, our energy, being, even being at home, restricting ourselves from the social interaction is already exhaustive because we somehow, a lot of people succumb to a state of depression because they are not able to interact. They are not able to um, have discussion in competing deliverables because it's all on their own space. Yeah, they don't have this um, contingency to actually reach out. So th this is where, um, when it comes to employees' well-being outside of the financial side, it's very good if the employer can actually give some flexibility. Okay, understand. So, um, Derek, it goes to you. So, in this topic about how employers or the company would be able to support the staff, the employee, in, you know, in their financial challenges, what's your take in it? What's your perspective that you know you could share to us? Um, I mean, speaking as an employee myself, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not an expert in this field, you know, but speaking as an employee myself, you know, I think. Financially, you know, it is uh, of course strictly PNC. It is between the company and the and the employer and, and the employee, you know. But I think uh, what is important sometimes, especially nowadays, is that you know sometimes it's not just the money, all right. Sometimes it is the environment that you can provide for them to perform and uh, you know uh, release it at the at their very best. And you know, to me, the most important factor is trust. Right, because um, what the employ the reason why there's a contract signed between the employee and the employer is that you know mutually they are agreeable to to something uh, that works best for the two parties. So I think with that in mind, trust is very important, and of course, ultimately, you know, it is a result oriented thing, whereby you know, like what John asked just now, you know, will it will, will allowing the flexibility actually hinder 
any of the you know the the performance or efficiency of the of the employee and you know to me it, it will all reflect in the result all right so trust is very important because if you were to trust the employee then they would you know feel that they are appreciated and they are not taken for granted and you know that would actually hopefully lead to them uh, being more motivated and more willing to actually uh, do their best for the company. I think that that would actually uh, strike the best environment for any employee. Of course, you know, financially it is important, but I think um, I would imagine that as a HR, you know, that they, they, they have certain budgets or restrictions whereby, you know, of course, any employee would want more money, right? Nobody would tell tell HR that, hey, you're paying me too much, all right? But I think, you know, we can always settle down on a, on a agreed amount whereby we feel comfortable and, you know, the thing that's more to that would be actually to feel appreciated and that would provide the best kind of balance to take care of one's overall well-being working for a company. All right. Thank, thanks, Derek. Um, okay, a shout out to our participants. So feel free to drop us any questions in Slido, the link uh, shared in the chat. Um, if you have anything um, that you want to, you know, ask our panelists today. So we have Dr. Nabila and uh, Mr. Derek. So um, both of them can answer some of the, maybe some of the financial doubts that you have, you know, probably some myths that you, you might have you know, um, in, in managing your own finances. And, you know, at near the, uh, you know, in, in a few more, I think in, let's say three o'clock, probably I will prompt uh, Derek to share a little bit on how you could uh, sort of have a way to look at your own financial health and assess where you are currently. So um, currently coming back to, let's say, the topic of financial literacy as a whole, I think uh, Dr. Navila, we also you know, briefly discussed about it and you are in the work of so providing education for some of them to, you know, to better manage their finances, especially in the B40 community. In your opinion, you know, as uh, fellow Malaysians, what's, what's the thing that you see that is lacking in the current uh, education system that uh, enables Malaysians to really manage their financial better? Um, I guess it's more to exposure. At, like I think like Derek has mentioned just now, information is everywhere. So it's then it comes to a sense whether or not you are willing to spend some time to actually read about it and understand uh, things, especially when it comes to financial management. Um, because it's some it's not something that you only read and you just uh, and you just like put aside and move on with your life. It's something that you experience every single day. So um. In, in when we talk about financial management, of course, I I'm, uh, I believe a lot of us uh, has made financial mistakes before this, or perhaps um, along the way uh, you had some um, crisis that you 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 need to resolve when it comes to monetary terms. But uh, again, I would uh, I really uh, one thing that I really um, like. Uh, feel Malaysians are very skeptic about is number one investment of course and then uh, number two would be about saving from a young age because you know you know the how the culture is in Malaysia like when we are kids we always get with raya we get ang pao but but that is not being sustained when we get older those are being confiscated by the parents not yeah not <laughs> <laughs> then it's so for another purpose. So I, I, one thing that I really missed about um, financial education in a younger age would be, um, I, I'm not sure if uh, everyone in the audience remember, uh, Bank Negara used to issue buku wangsaku to actually record your expenditure, the kids' expenditure from a very young age. But it, it, it's, it's not really available now because now we're shifting to a more digi digital side. We have MEE to see, to look into the budget. We have also ASNB's um, apps to actually help to look out. But um, going from a younger perspective, uh, talking about saving from young, because I think Derek also mentioned about consistent uh, investment. So I, I think this is very true because um, it's not... Uh, it's not about when it comes to investment or even about saving. It's not about your end goal. It, of course, it's about your end goal. But are you willing to wait long enough for you to actually see how much your saving have grown, how much your investment has provided you with, um, 
the additional passive income uh, from your uh, from what you have put in. So th this is also true in a sense when it comes to insurance because people don't see what is going to emerge at the end of the day. I think this is where a lot of people are skeptic of putting money in investment or putting money in uh, insurance because their level of understanding in these two things is available bit, but again, it's about whether you are willing to trust it or not. Because there's a lot of agents coming around, a lot, a lot of people who are willing to give information, but then you contradict with yourself. What I, should I invest now when I have so many expenditure? So this is where I really emphasize on understanding your expenditure. And also, I agree with what Derek said just now, to allocate a certain amount for your saving before you start spending every month. Because if you spend and then only you you then only you have the allocated amount for uh, for saving at the end of the month, it won't work. Consider then it consider uh, you need to consider your um attitude your your spending attitude all over again because it's good. Um, to me, I believe that you uh when you set aside a certain amount for saving, for example, or a certain amount for investment, it's like giving yourself a raise personally before you start like doing all this expenditure. Uh, because, you know, your expenditure might not uh, be personal. It might be for your family. It might be for your friends, like, like going out with your friends. But um, just having to, um, in essence, that this saving might not something that would reward you now, but for the longer term, it would be something that is uh, more beneficial. It's even even more that today, um, like I think John mentioned just now with iChitra being allowed, a lot of EPF withdrawals being done. Um, it's a concern that during the time that you would retire, perhaps 30, 40 years from now, you might not see, you not, might not believe it now, but um, later on, you might feel that that would be a constraint because during retirement you cannot you you might not have the effort to work anymore it's more to you are settling down with your kids you are more to um just to enjoy life without um having too much stress as before when you were younger hustling for uh, all the wonders of the world uh yeah so uh so in that sense in terms of fine uh giving a sense of comfort to yourself in terms of financial management. You can, you can spend if it, if it is within your means or within your terms, within your income. If you want to spend as much as you want, that's fine. But um, have a peace of mind with yourself that if let's say COVID happens again, if let's say there's a tragedy, and in case there is something that you never thought about. Where will you get a contingency plan when it comes to your um, monetary value? Okay, um, thanks, Doctor, for the sharing, and um, probably uh, I will go to Derek, and after shortly after that, we would you know get also Derek to share a little bit about the tools to sort of do a very quick financial health check, and after that, then we would go through some of the Q and A that's being posted in our Slido. We have a few questions, um, you know, on investment and uh, on for beginners and some um, myths that they, you know, they wanted to ask. So going going back to Derek, let's just, you know, wrap up this session. So about, um, let's say savings, I believe um, a lot relates back to, you know, discipline and making sure that, you know, um, they really spend within their means, you know, what sort of, um, uh, I would say like in, in, in your perspective, like what sort of advice do you give people like you, you know, you must save regardless of how much, you know, you must allocate and how you, you would advise people to stay committed to that. Yeah, thanks, John. I think, you know, discipline is everything here. All right. I think, you know, there is no, there is no magic formula here whereby actually it's just a simple mindset of like what uh, Dr. Nabila actually reiterated just now, whereby, you know, you should always save before you spend because once you have saved you can spend whatever is left you know sometimes it is not that we are you know not 
we are telling you not to spend because we have worked hard for our money. You know, it's, it's, it's all the effort put into it, you know, in order to go on a nice holiday or to buy a very nice pair of sneakers for ourselves. You know, I think that is something that we should all enjoy as well. But, you know, first things first is that, you know, you, you always need to save first before you spend. All right, because uh, we all know the, the importance of savings. We all know the importance of investment. And, you know, like, like what Dr. Nabila said, you never know when another major event like COVID or, you know, you never know when or what would actually hit us uh, as, as bad as what the last two years actually did. You know, so it is always about having that contingency plan, that comfort of knowing that you have an emergency fund well planned out you know, so that you can have that peace of mind for any future uh, emergencies. All right. So on top of that, you know, if, if you, you are able to be disciplined and committed to having this uh, financial backup plan, then, you know, whatever is left for you to spend, you know, I would, I would say, you know, by all means, you know, because that is your hard earned money and you deserve some kind of reward for all your hard work. Right. But of course, as long as it's within your means, then it is fine. Uh, okay, Derek. So now, uh, if you could just uh, simply share um, a, a tool for our listeners today, so sort of get a gauge uh, where are they in their current financial status. Uh, um, so what they can use to really assess. It's like a health check, lah. Now we, uh, I think Dr. Nabila mentioned about Secret. Secret is the one uh, like a more um, a, a official tool. But is there a simpler tool that you could share with our listeners today on how they could assess that? Yeah. You know, John, there, there's no magic formula here. It is not that complicated, all right? In 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 essence, you know, how one would actually uh, assess himself financially is, of course, you look at your income, you take away your commitments, you take away some of your important family spendings, and, you know, you may kind of have a rough idea what's left to save before you can even spend, you know? So that that is the first very quick uh, way to you know actually roughly gauge where you stand with regards to your income versus your monthly commitments but on the other hand you know maybe you can picture yourself in this scenario whereby if you were to lose your job today you know how would it actually impact you know your life from a financial perspective meaning to say uh, how much savings or how how long can your current savings actually sustain your current lifestyle, you know, supporting your family, maintaining the way you eat, the way you, you, you spend, you know, how long can it sustain you? And that should normally actually give you a very uh, clear indication as to whether, you know, there is something that needs to be done uh, on the financial side. Because like what I said earlier in the session, you know, a lot of us with our income coming in on a monthly basis, all is good. You know, under normal circumstances, we, we can get by, you know, we are living comfortably and we are quite happy with what we are earning and how we are living our lives. But, you know, that does not necessarily mean that financially you are well off, you know, because it is all about the what ifs, you know, what if COVID happens again? What if you lose your job? What if another disaster strikes, you know, and that is when you can truly see you know, how uh, prepared financially you are in order to face all these uh, emergencies. I, I totally agree with you there on the, you know, on keeping a track of your expenses and, you know, like monthly commitments. Then in your, in your opinion, I'm going to, I'm going to prompt you to give a figure today. Like, you know, how long does the savings, you know, you think in a healthy, you know, well, you know, well-planned financial person. I mean, any person, yeah? how long does the savings should last for you to consider it is healthy? At least it's something, you know, reasonable. Three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months? Oh, John, I'm going to disappoint you because when oh. it comes to long term, it's a lot longer than that, you know, because oh, okay. uh, like like investments wise, and we are talking about savings, right? You know, it is it is something that, is really starting by taking small steps as, you know, the saying goes, sikit sikit lama lama jadi bukit, right? You know, so, uh, you know, what we strongly advocate here is actually something very long term, you know, and, and that could actually stretch up to five, 10 years or even beyond that. The rule of thumb is the longer, the better, you know, because the, the reason, the reason being is that 
you can never predict when the markets are going up and when the markets are coming down. So it is not to say that, John, when you mentioned six months or 12 months or two years, sometimes, you know, if you are, you know, if you happen to be in the market at the right time, that is sufficient for you to make a good, you know, a good return. You know, but on the oh, really, let me let me just rephrase the, the the question again. What I mean is like just now you mentioned like savings should be able to last. Let's say if a person loses their job, you know, like yeah. you know for a certain period of months. Uh, actually, what I meant was more like how how long should the savings be able to sustain a person without a job? You know, for their savings to be considered as a, a, a healthy level of savings. Uh, I believe what you mentioned is more like investment yeah. durations, right? Yeah, all right. Uh, uh, sorry, so just yeah, just yeah. wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah, no yeah of, of course. I mean, it ultimately this uh, depends on your spending habits, right? You know, and you know, of course, uh, commitments wise is quite fixed, you know, but on the other hand, when it comes to spending, I'm sure in the event of, you know, losing a job or the event of an emergency, you would adjust your spending accordingly, you know, but you know, there's no fixed duration, but I would say that, you know, you need enough savings in order to sustain yourself before you can actually find another job. You know, some people might take one or two months before finding a new job. Some might even take one or two years, you know, depending on which industry you are in. You know, so so it all depends on the circumstances. So that's why the, the more savings you have, the more prepared you are. You know, I think I think that is, you know, the, the, the way that we can approach this. So, so to, to the listeners there, sorry, I can't take a, a real number from Derek, but at, basically from what Derek has shared, uh, the more the merrier, the more you invest is better, and of course, the more you save is better. Of course, uh, it applies to different situations as well. I believe all of us have different conditions that you know, we need to face, you know, um, and we need to feed the family and whatnot. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, I do agree that a, a planning at least plan a very rough um, financial plan for yourself, you know, what's your income, what's your expenses, and really, you know, have a basic uh, grasp of how many, how much money are you spending on what in, in a month, you know, I think, uh, I think now a lot of apps are available for you to keep track of your own expenses and give you a very brief summary. I, I personally highly encourage everyone to do that, uh, and that requires discipline as well. Um, so, um, so coming back to the questions, we actually have quite a lot of questions to start off with. So, um, our, you know, we will share the uh, screen on the uh, on the questions. Then we will probably go through a few of them. So, I think uh, let us go through which one. Uh, all right. Um, I am stressed by a debt that seems never ending. What should I do? Okay, debt management. So, um, Derek, what do you think? The first question. Well, I, I mean, that is, I mean, that that comes back to commitment, right? You know, I think, I think we are always, uh, all of us. I think we all have debts. You know, we we buy a house, we buy a car. I think that is uh, always there. You know, and that is why, you know, um, if you were to rely on simply your income every single month, and if you were to wash it out every single month with zero savings, then that's when the stress builds up. You know, because you are always feeling that you are living on the edge. You know, if something were to happen, then that's it, you're in trouble. You know, so that is why, you know, coming back to how financial well-being links to, you know, your health. You know, this is precisely, I think, the, the prime example of it. Because while you are paying off your debt, it can still be very stressful. Because you would, if, if you were to not have anything left every single month, that is when you, you feel that it's never ending, you know, uh, and, and you start to think about all the what ifs and, you know, things can happen and it might affect you, uh, affect your life. You know, so that is why, you know, uh, one thing that you should do is, of course, you know, uh, depending on your own affordability, all right, depending on your income versus your, your debt or your commitments, you know, try to set aside uh, something for you to save. It can be something as little as, 100 ringgit a month, you know, I think one of the common misconceptions about savings or investments is that you need to have a lot of money before you can start, uh, you know, some kind of investments. That's actually not true. You know, it is precisely because you don't have the savings that you should start to do it and you should start to invest. You know, so 
uh, it can be very affordable. You know, not all investment instruments out there require a large sum of money. You know, so uh, you can even begin something like regular investments from as low as 100 ringgit a month. You know, and that over time would help you build up the, the financial backup that you need to ease some of your burden from really relying on solely your income uh, from your job. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Derek. Um, I think I'm going to skip this uh, this part. Uh, is it worth paying for a financial advisor? I, I think, you know, the value depends on what you get out of it. I think if you get a very qualified advisor, definitely you're going to get more than what you pay. Um, so I, I'm going to skip this, but um, I'm going to direct the next question. Is this a good timing to get a house with the current offer, housing loans, or is it better to hold cash or equity investment? Do Dr. Nabila, I'll let you answer this question because you did mention a little bit about, you know, um, some housing loans just now. So what do you think about this? Yeah, all right. Very good question. Because a lot of people, they, they, they sometimes they think about uh, getting a house something sometimes because because of the offers that we have now is very very um lucrative very very interesting for it to be to be looked at because um then we, it goes back to your own your personal goal of having a house so if if you have certain um certain like certain goals of um purchasing a house then um i think during the pandemic time, because we have, I think since um, three, four years ago, we have been, um, uh, we have been observing um, this um, bubble burst in the in the housing uh, sector. We are estimating the price will drop, but uh, currently it's uh, it's more to looking into the demand side as well because people with more offers that is being uh, that is being offered. Rent to rent to own. Um, they have uh, the, the the first ownership scheme. Um, it's it's good for you to reflect back and ask yourself, do I really need a house at this point of time? Because having a house is more of a uh, of essential needs. Like if you can't afford to buy a house, you can always opt to rent a house. So if your financial uh, financial um, standpoint uh, is that you, it's not stable enough for you to be able to purchase a house. So I believe um, equity investment will be a better option. But if you feel like you understand the, the uh, property market even more, that you want to make the property as an investment, uh, I think you you might need to read up a little bit more to look also into the circumstances or the consequences that might uh, might happen if you decide your property is not for you to um, not for you to uh, stay but it's more to property for you to rent because you need to look over the market all over again you need to see whether the demand for rental is good at that particular um, that particular site or, or that particular location then it's it, it, it goes back to your intention of purchasing that house. If it's more for you to stay, you, you want to be comfortable for you to stay, then it's good for you to uh, start looking into uh, the promotion, the options that the government has. But if, you, you're, if you're looking into making this um, property investment as another uh, option for you to uh, gauge with income, I think something that you need to ponder upon, there are quite large risks that you might need to face throughout your process of uh, acquiring the property. Then it goes back whether you are purchasing a new house or are you purchasing a, a subcontracted house or are you uh, purchasing a uh, rumah lelong. Then it goes back to what budget you have and do you think with your budget is enough to cover um, for your expenditure on the house because even for new houses these days even though uh, you might say okay lah um, first housing scheme uh, I can get waived with a lot of things my legal fee waived SPA waived but then again as you uh, as you have landed with the housing loan it doesn't take until the house is done for you to start repaying that loan it starts from now it starts from when you actually sign the agreement for you to uh, obtain that loan so uh, think again, 
the options that you have. If it's if it's not necessary for you to purchase a house at this point of time, I would say good for you to start looking at investment first because when you have um uh, when you in, when you have good and steady amount of investment on the future side when you decide okay now is the time for me to get a house then you have your uh, you have your passive income coming from your investment to actually support you with your purchase yeah, I totally resonate with Dr. Navila on that. You know, I think yeah, of, of my personal opinion, not as any financial advisor, if the property is for stay, I think then if you're ready, then it's okay. But if for investment, I think probably think twice that other instruments uh, probably can, can, could give a better risk portfolio and better uh, return, uh, in my opinion. And I think the, the question, uh, the, the current question is, you know, you probably uh, would ask a financial advisor, what sort of choice of investment in the market? So uh, I will probably also will skip this uh, for the sake of Dr. Navilla. Um, I, I think I, will, I would like I like the, the answer to the second question. So uh, I'll pass this to Derek. Just now mentioned about you know uh, spending and whatnot. If I save money, I become unhappy uh, with reducing a lot of spending, which would make me happy. You know, I think this is a lot of um, people's dilemma when they come to, you know, like we call it discipline in terms of financial spending. You know, what's your take in that? You know, just now you mentioned that it's not restrictive, but sometimes it's delayed. How would you say to this? Yeah, yeah, thanks, John. I think, you know, that's especially, I would say that especially among young people nowadays, that's the, the you know, the one of the biggest uh, million dollar question that they have, you know, because they want to spend and it's always about instant gratification, right? We are always looking to gain as much as possible in the short term, you know, uh, uh, from what we have already earned, you know, so that that what that is why I'm not actually surprised by this uh, question. So my take would actually be, you know, um, when it comes to happiness, maybe I would like to ask you, you know, do you want to be, you know, if spending makes you happy, do you want to be happier? All right, because because I think if the answer is yes, then definitely, you know, in the long run, uh, you can be happier if you were to manage your finances better, you know, because what by, by spending money and, you know, spending on, I would assume, luxury goods or things that you can afford to not have uh, currently. Yes, it makes you happy in the short term, you know, you're happy, you, you for example, you enjoy a nice meal, you go on holiday, you wear a nice pair of sneakers and everybody goes, wow, how do you manage to cop that sneakers, you know? But, you know, if you want to be happier, you know, in the long run for the sake of, you know, your family, for yourself, especially, you know, even as long as after you retire, then I think this is something that you have to strongly think about because I, I can almost guarantee you that this is going to make you happier in the long run. You know, I think I would like to actually uh, bring out this uh, this article that I actually read last year, I believe, towards the end of last year from EPF, you know, whereby EPF actually highlighted that only 3% of Malaysians can afford to retire, you know, and at age 54, which is one year before the retirement age, you know, I think more than half of the EPF contributors have less than 50,000 in their EPF, you know, for their retirement. So with that amount of money at age 55, will you be happy? You know, if you were to live, let's say, you know, nowadays life expectancy is going up in Malaysia, you know, health benefits, everything, we eat better. You know, I think if you were to live, let's say just for example, 20 or 30 years after your retirement, you know, what is 50,000 over 20 years? And with that kind of spending, how are you going to be happy? You know, it's certainly not able to sustain your happiness as compared to what you are living right now. You know, so that is why I say that, you know, yes, spending now can make you happy. But I would say that if you were to save money, that would contribute a lot more to, you know, uh, your, your, your happiness in the long run. All right. So, of course, it's, it is not either or. You know, it is not to say that you're not allowed to spend like what I said before. You are still allowed to spend, but always be mindful of your savings first before you can check your means and to spend within your means. Yeah. 
Dr. Navila, do you want to, you know, supplement any points? Yes, I think this is a very interesting question. I think this is something that um, my student always come to me because in, in terms of, of trying to start CV. Because some, some, uh, somehow rather in a lot of times they are uh, either um, having a one for themselves or sometimes it's just a peer pressure, like everybody else has this, but I don't have it. So it's it's more to like, uh, I, I for more, for more. Uh, for more, very for more. Yeah. So I, I I think in this sense, if let's say for example, you you you've never saved any money before, like whatever you get from your income, it's all uh, uh, to your uh, all your uh, obligations or, or all your expenses. Um, try try uh, to to. To identify whether you're happy or not and not to say because when you say it, you become unhappy with reducing a lot of spending it's not that we're trying to tell you you need to reduce a lot we're just we're just trying to encourage you to start spending so my take on this um, try to save one ringgit if you if you cannot have it daily make it uh, weekly or monthly just try one ringgit first at the beginning and see and I, I think you can see for yourself uh let's say you put uh, one ringgit. I'm, uh, let's say, let's say it, it goes back to the goals. Let's say I want to save one ringgit every day, right? I'm going to give um, around three months to see how much I can save for the time being, right? So you ju you just have this um, this extra couch or extra um, space that you can put your one ringgit or your tabung lah, basically, right? You have your one ringgit. If you can't, you don't you don't feel safe in your own bank account. You take it physically and put it in your uh, in your tabo. All right. Uh, so try to have that consistent for three months and see if it makes you happier. So then if 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 you feel that it doesn't take really much of an effort to take out one ringgit daily, then you start making it consistent. So this is where the point of having consistent saving and consistent investment comes in. It's not that you're going to give out a whole but a whole chunk of your money to uh, somewhere you don't trust or some savings that you don't really see uh, what's the end game will be like but more to for you to realize if you have an extra cash at the end of the month or the end of the day wouldn't that make you even better totally agree i think um uh, both dr nabila and derek has pointed out you know do you want to be happy now or you want to be happier later? And of course, um, there, there are a lot of choices that we make uh, in terms of financials for the spending. You know, there are things that probably would make us happy, um, but, you know, we need to also, also allocate for long term. So a, a brief disclaimer here to our listeners there is we, we try not to give very directed investment advice here. So I would skip like questions like is buying gold a good expense? Is crypto a good investment? We will skip this kind of thing. We will go in the a bit broader perspective of sort of what direction that, you know, we, we you know, you could take. So um, going back to the first one. Okay, I think I think this question is very valid uh, in terms of scams and uh, uh, trusted uh, investment agencies. Is there a site maybe from Derek? Is there a site or reference that you know our listeners can go to to verify is if the company that they are trying to approach is a, a valid company? Uh, yeah, yes, John. You know, in fact, uh, we are a highly regulated industry, so. For, for mutual funds or unit trust uh, industry, you can actually go to the FIMM website. FIMM stands for Federation of uh, Investment Malaysia, uh, Managers Malaysia. You can actually check out their website or you can actually go to the Security Commission's uh, Malaysia website. And you know, you can always find the companies that are that are listed there, you know. And you know, to take it further, you know, I think someone actually asked about financial advisors uh, just now, right? So if someone were to approach you uh, presenting to you products related to unit trust, uh, you can actually uh, do a check on this person, whether they are a licensed uh, consultant by uh, doing a search on the FIM, FIMM website as well. Yeah. Okay. Is, is there any also channel that they could raise if they say they are being, you know, being scammed or is there any protective, you know, measures that, you know, any organization that you know of? Um, I, I think there are too many scams out there, you know, so I think, you know, a lot of them, it is difficult to track. So I, I think immediately I would say that, you know, 
if it's not related to unit trust. Of course, if it's related to the unit trust industry, whereby there could be scams as well, whereby you know things like uh, misrepresentation or misleading, or if there's any instances whereby whereby you know you feel that this person is not uh, authorized, you know you can always file a complaint to FIMM. Yeah, but of course for any other uh, industries, it's difficult to advise, but you know. I think that is why it's so important to try and avoid the scams out there. You know, that's happening a lot recently. Yeah. True. Um, here, here's a question, you know, from uh, listeners also. I think it's more the um, investment uh, direction, like uh, which would it be better to buy asset or keep cash? I think in the current condition, and also perhaps even when they retire, when they get a big sum of money. You know, uh, I think we, when we talk about retirement, you also talk about, you know, we should also think about the 20 years that you mentioned that post retirement, right? In, 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 in the, in your opinion, right? When they get that sum of money, should they just leave it as it is and just, you know, chip it off uh, year on year, day on day, or they should reinvest that amount of money. I think this one, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let both of you guys, uh, probably I'll start with Derek first, then to Dr. Navilla. Yeah, thanks, John. You know, I, I think, of course, definitely the first thing that we would advocate strongly is to buy assets, you know, because I think in the long term, it's going to make you in a better financial standing, you know, but of course, you know, you must always strike a balance whereby it is, you must be mindful of the cash that you have as well, because uh, when it comes to the emergency cases and you need some cash, for example, it would be unwise to sell off an asset for cash. You know, because it, it, it might not be in your favor to do so at that current juncture. So we do not want that additional risk of having to sell off an asset for cash in an event of an emergency. You know, so it is always uh, difficult but important to be mindful of having uh, an emergency cash. But any additional of that, you know, definitely I would advocate buying asset, you know, to, to hedge against inflation, to make your money grow. Even money in the bank account doesn't grow, you know, uh, uh, enough in order to cover inflation. You know, so that is why the importance of buying asset is so, so important. You know, so, so definitely for that, I would uh, strongly recommend uh, buying assets within your means. Um, Dr. Navila, what's your take on that? Yeah, I totally agree with Derek because we are um, we are quite um, having an impression, we, which is true, that we need to have assets. That is true. But um, then again, you need to remember, let's say, for example, you're purchasing a house or purchasing a car. It's not your ultimate ownership. When you start to, uh, when you when you obtain a loan for a house or for a car, the, the car or the house ownership is still on the bank. It's not it's not hundred percent yours until you finish paying off your debt. So oh, having that said, um, uh, I know I know a lot of people have this uh, misconception that oh because I have I I have the assets physically so I consider it mine. But all in all, as long as you are um, attached with the loan agreement with the bank then the ownership is not solely yours. So um, in t what, uh, then it comes to uh, the issue of liquidity. Uh, I, do you prefer to have uh, an asset, a liquid asset that you can, you have access to, that you can actually start using uh, as soon as you face with certain circumstance, uh, circumstances in life? Or do you, do you prefer to have uh, something like a, uh, a period for you to actually uh, go and sell your assets, then only you can obtain the cash for you to solve your problems. Because um, when it comes, yeah, uh, except if you if you're purchasing, if you have enough money to purchase that asset, like okay, I'm going to give you five thousand one car, come out, right? Uh, then it goes back to if you are able to sustain after purchasing that. So uh, I think there's also a question whether it, it is wise to buy the items like a car or a house after retirement day. Then that is also um, similar, it's from a similar perspective. Uh, do you think that after retirement day, the day that you are no longer working, the day that you are no longer generating your active income, uh, will you be able to sustain uh, the maintenance 
of these two big items because you 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 cannot consider purchasing that item itself you need to also think about the depreciation you also need to think about the additional expenditure that you might need to incur after you purchase this kind of asset like for cars you need you need to allocate for fuel you need to allocate for touch and go you need to allocate for repairment service so this is something that somehow rather is behind of uh, people's mind but is actually very essential to also be considered same with houses if you if there's major repairment your uh, your electricity bill utility bills that is the things that you also need considered as part of your expenses once you have acquired these kind of assets. I, I think totally agree. Some people, they just look into the first transaction. They don't look into the sus sustainability of the asset. And, and for, for the information of the, you know, the listeners here, the asset, I think in, in this term is not only houses, it, 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 it can represent any um, uh, assets that could give you some growth and wealth, uh, uh, maybe even some investment like equities and whatnot. Those are considered assets as well. So uh, I, I, we have, I think probably a time for one last question, and I'll, I'll give the, um, the benefit to you know um, both speakers just to get a very quick one. I highlighted the, the, the question. Um, in your opinion, uh, what is the healthy allocation or spending of income that is considered healthy from both, let's say, direct you first? In terms of very rough percentage, in your opinion? Yeah, I think I would actually like to tweak the question from another perspective, whereby mm -hmm. I would think it's healthier to actually allocate savings rather than spending. Because, yeah. you know, like what we have, you know, been talking about, you know, um, always save before you spend. So before you start thinking about spending, it's always better to think about savings. All right. So, uh, of course, you know, what kind of percentage you know it is there's no truly right or wrong answer here because ultimately it depends on your income it depends on the affordability from your financial positions as to how much you can save per month how much you want to save per month and then the the percentage will actually uh would actually change so what i would say is that in order to be healthy is we don't want it to become a burden for you so for example if you are earning let's say four thousand ringgit a, a month you know everybody would like to save as much as possible so it does it mean that the more you save the healthier it is you can save half of it 2000 ringgit which is very good you know it's a substantial saving and it can build towards a very substantial financial standing for you in the long term but will it hinder your immediate well-being uh, by you know uh, you know paying off your monthly commitments you know or sacrificing some of your spendings because as today's forum is, you know, we are talking about financial well, uh, well-being versus your health, right? And yeah. I do agree and I would, you know, I, I would say that, you know, sometimes spending contributes to your well, your health as well, your well-being overall. You Otherwise, so, they'll be unhappy, right? <laughs> yeah, correct. You know, I mean, we don't want the savings, however important and useful it is, to be a detrimental factor to your immediate well-being. You know, so it is always about striking the balance. Uh, like like what we said, you know, it is not an either or question. It is not you either save or you spend, but allocate a certain amount that you are comfortable with from a financial point of view to save, let's say, for example, 20, 30 percent. And then, you know, you can look at your overall income. You can take away your commitments, take away your important family spendings, take away the allocated savings. And, you know, whatever is left, you know, you will be more than happy to actually spend on yourself. You know, I think that would create a very comfortable and, you know, sustainable lifestyle for each and every one of us. And and of course, I think savings, you can start low and slowly, you know, up up yep. bet, right? Like maybe you start yep. from of 10, you plus 15, then you go 20 as you as your means go. Dr. Damila, uh, what's your take on this? Yeah, I totally agree with um, what you said, what Derek said. So uh, it, it goes back to your, um, what you spend every month, to understand what you spend every month. You have, uh, I think a good thing to start as a starting point is for you to be able to identify your commitments because uh, you know what ha whatever happens when you have uh, your income every month, the first thing that you need to prioritize is your commitment before you go to your wants. And once is once is supposed to be like very very last part, right? Like uh, and also like Derek said, uh, the rec uh, what what is good for for 
perceiving to happen is should be around 20 to 30 percent. So I, I, I think there's a, there's a popular um, budget rule by Elizabeth Warren that says um, 50, 20, 30, which is 50 on needs, 30 on wants, and 20 on savings. I think that would be a good ratio for you to start. But uh, then again, it's, it's, not, um, it's not that it's permanent or it is enforceable to everybody because we know different people has different needs, different people has different um, responsibilities. They have different commitments. So um, adjust it uh, by your own, by your personal, um, what you think is manageable. Because at the end of the day, what we want to, uh, what we want to advocate here is that you start doing savings. You start to realize investment is important. Not, not, not necessarily. Oh, after today's forum, or oh, you, you need to start investing. You need to start saving. But have it baby steps. If you, if you cannot afford to um, have um, around uh, 100 ringgit, 200 ringgit, such big amounts, start, start little. And it, it. I, I assure you, when you, when you start to um, repurpose your commitment as well as your needs and your wants, you'll be able to start to allocate that amount for your savings. Because um, when it comes to your wants, it's always debatable. It's always considerable. There's always something that can actually refrain you from actually getting it. Let's say, for example, oh, my friends have iPhone, I need to have iPhone. But there's, there's also a spec, another spec of smartphone that you can, you, can, uh, you can purchase at much lesser amount. That doesn't mean that you're outside of the circle. It's just, it just means that you are spending within your means. Because uh, what's important is even though your income and another person's income can be quite the same, but at the end of the day, uh, you need to look into what you spend in order for you to identify what you are capable of saving. Okay. I think the bottom line is there's no hard and fast rule on how much um, savings that should be possible. But here we want to advocate the habit of savings um, as little as maybe even one ringgit or you know five ringgit a day. It's always good to start and slowly escalate on top of that, you know, slowly and when you're comfortably and um, always um, safe before spent. So we do have a lot of questions, but we unfortunately we are running out of time that we, we can't address it. I'll probably one shout out to Derek. Maybe you can just briefly talk about the rich fund uh, and then we will wrap up. Yeah, all right. Thanks, John. You know, I, th I think a lot of you definitely you are thinking of what's one way that, you know, you can start uh, your investment journey. And I think one of the one of the easiest and stress-free way of actually starting your investment journey is by REACH, which at East Spring Investments, we call it regular investment choice. So this is basically a, a, an auto debit system whereby on a monthly basis, you are committed a certain amount to actually invest into one of our funds. And you know, the investment is done by a professional fund manager. You know, the amount is as low as 100 ringgit. So, so you, you don't have to stress yourself about too much. So the, the concept about rich is that, you know, you pay yourself first. I think what Dr. Nabila actually just now mentioned is like getting a raise, you know, whereby, uh, you know, on top of your monthly income, if you can take a portion and pay yourself first for the long term, I think that's very important. You know, you, you, you start as early as possible. So there's no, it's never too late or never too early to start. So the most important thing is to start early and, you know, keep it for the long term. And, you know, I think one big, big major advantage that this regular investment choice can give to you is that you don't have to time the market because regardless whether market is up or down, every single month you are committed to a certain amount to actually invest. So you don't have to think about whether market is good, market is bad. I saw a lot of questions just now in the current situation, should I redeem my investment or in the current situation, should I enter or what's the best option should I do now? You know, it's very stressful thinking about these kind of things. And to be frank, unless you have a crystal ball, you know, nobody can give you the right answer to this. So that 
that is what makes regular investments so beautiful, you know, whereby you don't have to time the market. And like what I said just now, you just have to give it time and over time it will grow. And of course, you know, while it may be only as slow as 100 ringgit uh, a month, you know, a little goes a very long way when it comes to investments over the long run, you know, sikit sikit, lama lama jadi bukit. All right, so I think if you want more information about regular investments, you can please feel free to go to our website, www.espring.com slash my. You know, uh, we have a lot of information about regular investments there that you can read up on. There are a lot of insights and we even have a money parenting uh, section whereby for all the parents out there who are not just thinking about your personal financial well-being, but also planning for your kids, you know, like what Dr. Nabila said just now, you know, I think the exposure given to especially kids in Malaysia uh, today is not enough for financial literacy. You know, so that is why we have this campaign whereby we want to assist parents in starting to educate your kids, you know, from a young age. All right, so do check out the website. There's a lot of information out there and I hope this can help, you know, kickstart your investment journey together with eSpring Investments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Dr. Nabila. For the questions that we did not manage to answer during the, this session, this forum, we will compile it and we will send uh, to Dr. Nabila and Derek for their feedback and we will share it via either an ebook or like a blog post uh, via email later on after the event. So um, thank you very much again, Dr. Nabila, Derek, for the kind sharing and the fruitful session. So um, please give a reaction, a thumbs up in the comments or maybe through the reactions. So so uh, just to express your um, uh, how say appreciation to the speakers today and say uh, a big thank you to you all and um, sorry to overshoot a little bit. So we are moving on to the next session and I will pass back to Kai for uh, the, 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 to MC the following session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, Dr. Thank Nabila. You. Thank you.